Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Museum of the African Diaspora online. My name is Elizabeth Gessel, and I'm the Director of Public Programs. MOAD is a contemporary art museum, and our exhibitions and programming inspire learning through the global lens of the African diaspora. I want to take a moment to acknowledge the challenging circumstances we are all in, and I hope everyone in the audience today is safe and healthy. MOAD stands in solidarity with Black Lives Matter. We honor and mourn the senseless murders of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, Casey Goodson Jr., and Andre Hill. We grieve for so many others who have lost their lives at the hands of state-sanctioned violence and racial injustice, including those whose names we do not know. As this list continues to grow, MOAD will continue to say their names as our commitment to honoring the victims and to attaining true racial justice is unwavering. As many of us are settlers, immigrants, or descendants of those forcefully brought to this continent, our institutions were founded upon exclusions and erasures of the indigenous peoples on whose land we are located. With deep respect, Moad acknowledges that even in virtual space, we reside on unceded native lands and thank the indigenous people of the Bay Area who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. I welcome you all to this program series, African Diaspora Film Club, presented in partnership with Black Public Media. Our host, Cornelius Moore, is the co-director of California Newsreel, a 52-year-old social issue nonprofit film and distribution company. He is also an independent film curator specializing in works from and about the Black world. Modeled after a book club, we expect that you will have already viewed the film when you join us for this discussion. But if you haven't seen the film, please stick around. We just can't guarantee that we won't have any spoilers. I want to thank everyone here today who's joined us with special appreciation for those who have donated to the museum during this pandemic. We would not be able to produce this programming without your support. Today we'll be discussing the fabulous documentary, How It Feels to be Free. And we are thrilled to have joining us for the discussion, director Yoruba Richin. Yoruba Richin is an award-winning documentary filmmaker whose work has been featured on PBS, New York Times OpDoc, Frontline Digital, New York Magazine's website, The Cut, The Atlantic, and Field of Vision. Her film, How It Feels to be Free, premiered on PBS American Masters just in January of 2021. Her other recent films include The New York Times Presents, The Killing of Breonna Taylor, which premiered on FX and Hulu, and the sit-in, Harry Belafonte hosts The Tonight Show, which was broadcast on MSNBC and is streaming on Peacock. Her previous film, The Green Book, Guide to Freedom, was broadcast on the Smithsonian Channel and was nominated for an Emmy. Her films, The New Black and Promised Land, won multiple festival awards before airing on PBS's Independent Lens and POV. Yoruba won the Creative Promise Award at Tribeca All Access and was a Sundance Producers Fellow. She is the 2016 recipient of the Chicken and Egg Breakthrough Filmmaker Award and a Guggenheim Fellow. Yoruba is the founding director of the documentary program at the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at City University, New York. So we'll start the discussion this evening with Cornelius and Yoruba, and we will encourage everyone to participate by making comments in the chat and submitting questions through the Q&A box. And finally, please take a moment to type where you are joining us from in the chat. We love finding the diaspora in our audience. So welcome Cornelius and Yoruba, take it away. Thank you, Elizabeth, and welcome Yoruba. Thank you for joining us and being part of a, and for, ha, having done this very extraordinary film, congratulations. Um, I expect there'll be a lot of questions from the audience based from the questions that I've gotten uh, previously about the film, how people excited people are about it. Awesome, thank you for having me. Certainly. Thank you, Moad, and, and thank you, Cornelius. You're welcome. And it's out, you're, you were on earlier this week with Ishara Ekandayo with um, um, a program that she's doing. So it's like you're a resident filmmaker for MOAD this, this week. 
Well, as I was saying earlier, before we got on, Moab supported me in my first ever film, Promised Land. So uh, I'm so happy to be back and, and really thankful for the, for the support um, of both you, Cornelius, and California and Israel and, and, and Moab. So it's really fun to be talking with you. Great. So how it feels to be free. We thank uh, Nina Simone for the title. Uh, or you were choosing the title from the uh, from the Nina Simone song. So, Lena Horne, Diane Carroll, Abby Lincoln, Nina Simone, Cicely Tyson, Pam Greer. Each of those women have had rich lives and very storied careers, and so much so that they could have had their own films um, uh, on, based on themselves. So. Please tell us why you decided to to connect them and, and and do a documentary with all of them together. Yeah, so um, I uh, picked up a book, actually a, a review of a book mm -hmm. called How It Feels to Be Free, uh, Black Female, Inter African American Female Entertainers in the Civil Rights Movement by uh, Professor Ruth Feldstein in mm. 2014. Mm -hmm. And um, even when I read the review, even before I read the actual book, I thought that the take that this book had, which was, which looked at the entertainers, Lena, uh, Lena Horne, Nina Simone, Diane Carroll, Abby Lincoln, Cicely Tyson, and Miriam McCabe actually, mm -hmm. um, and looked at how these women uh, reshaped how Black women were seen on stage and screen and how their political work was both uh, the work that they did off screen in terms of participating in marches and part of the civil rights movement, but also on screen, mm -hmm. their representation and how they changed how Black women were seen uh, mm -hmm. on, you know, on stage and screen. And I thought it was just an amazing take that I hadn't seen before. I ended up switching out um, Miriam McCabe and, uh, and including Pam Greer because I thought she could bring us to a more contemporary moment. Because mm -hmm. um, I wanted, I definitely wanted to talk about what, uh, how these women set up what we see today in terms of African American female storytelling. Mm -hmm. And I was, um, so yes, yeah, so I was really enamored by and taken by the take of, you know, this wasn't um, a biopic necessary, but really looked at, at how these women change representation. And that's what I wanted the, the film to be about. Okay. And, and, this, and this book mm -hmm. had that take and looked at how these women also built off of each other and built mm -hmm. off of their um, careers and and went further and pushed it further than the woman you know than those who came before them. Yeah. And and you were maybe faced with a, a challenge of choosing other women too. You know, like um, who I I can think of somebody like Eartha Kitt or who got into trouble because she criticized the Vietnam War in the White House with Lady Bird Johnson. And that really affected her career, and or Louis D, or um, in a number of I was thinking of Freddie Washington. Yeah, Josephine oh, Baker. Yeah. I mean, Baker. really, what what ended up? I mean, we had the sort of those women who were in the book, which you know, mm -hmm. were specific women, and obviously there's only so much we can do. But mm -hmm. we did want to nod to these other women who you just mentioned, like mm -hmm. a Josephine Baker, um, uh, Freddie Washington. Um, uh, and other women who were also very transformative mm -hmm. uh, in their work. But obviously, you know, we can't do no. everything, so. <laughs> Unless it's part two, <laughs> you know, you know but, but you had, uh, I read, and yes, you said that it took you five years to get this done. So what, what was the obstacle what, what, other than what, what we maybe expect about people not honoring these women, but in, in your own words, tell us, please. Money. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, somebody just asked me what the name of the book is. I'm, I'm, I'm putting it in the chat. Yeah. Um, so, you know, this was my third film. 
-hmm. And I do think that funding might have been easier uh, with this film. I thought it was, you know, you had these great women, you had like amazing performances, you have like these stories that hadn't been told. Um, but it took, and we got support early from PBS, which has supported all of my films, mm -hmm. uh, Black Public Media, uh, uh, ITVS, um, American Masters, which came mm -hmm. in with early support. Mm -hmm. But it takes, you know, documentary films aren't cheap. So mm -hmm. it takes money um, to get, you know, to get a full production. And we had to really find, we got early support, people were into the idea, mm -hmm. they loved the idea, but we had to take, to get that production funding took a while. Mm -hmm. And we ended up working with a Canadian production company that ended up uh, leveraging Canadian tax credits um, to get the production funding together. I did not get funding. As I said, I had the PBS realm, I had Chicken and Egg, which mm -hmm. is a, um, a wonderful, foundation that supports women filmmakers where I received an award, but I didn't get funding from other places. I applied, I mean, I don't, I don't need to go through the list. Yeah. I, yeah. The funding did not come from there. That's really interesting that you got money from Canada because they're, you know, oftentimes with, into, you know, there are nationalist kind of impulses in funders and then there are no, none of the women are, are, have a Canadian connection or do, do they? No. no, they don't. But we met, my producers uh, met the, uh, the head of a production company called Yap Films, based mm -hmm. in Toronto, and they immediately w loved the topic, loved uh, the team, and said that they would, you know, figure out how to get this funding so we can get it made, and that's what happened. I'm mm -hmm. eternally grateful. And you have a lot of clips, TV clips, movie clips, and that must have probably cost a bit, good deal of money to do that. Definitely did. Archival is, um, can be a real, uh, you know, a real challenge. Mm -hmm. But we always knew that we were gonna try to, uh, you know, use fair use. Mm -hmm. um, and we did, and we had a great lawyer who helped us do that. It was a lot of work, but we did that. Uh, you know, archival, someone said, the filmmaker, the great filmmaker, Shala Lynch said, mm. said once when I was on a panel with her that these archival houses have, um, are holding hostage our history mm -hmm. because the, it's so expensive for, mm -hmm. our, you know, for the archive. And the archive um, has a lot of, you know, especially when we're doing obviously a film about our icons, our entertainers, and, you know, we have to figure out other ways else we can never tell those stories because mm -hmm. it's just too expensive. So uh, fair use has definitely been one of the ways um, and relying on fair use law. I mean, it's very rigorous, you know, mm -hmm. to figure out how to do that, but it's definitely been an important, um, important mechanism to use our, are to use the archive. It's a really important point you're raising about the access to to the, the footage and and the difficulty that some entities will put up be, uh, because of money and the like, but but not understanding that it's it's you know our heritage. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean the other part of it is that um, before 1960 it's very yeah. hard to find black archives because they weren't you know they were not um they they weren't interested in us <laughs> the entities mm -hmm. that you know that were doing the taping and the footage so it's i mean so that's another challenge mm -hmm. uh, and so when we do have you know these interviews that you know, i use interviews of you know abby lincoln in later years lena horn diane carroll i mean reflecting on their careers Mm -hmm. um, those are really important to understand, mm -hmm. you know, who they were and, you know, their, their importance in, you know, and they're reflecting, to see them reflect on mm -hmm. their own experience mm -hmm. um, is super, super uh, special. And, you know, we unfortunately lost uh, Cicely Tyson in the, la in the last few weeks. 
uh, just join the ancestors now. And most most of the women in the film have passed on. I was curious if you had were able to interview um, in the in the period that you were making the film the Diane Carroll and and Cicely Tyson who were still alive when you started the film. Yeah, we were able to <clears throat> interview Diane. Mm -hmm. So I'm so grateful that we were able to interview her before she passed. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we probably had one of the last interviews with her. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we were not able to interview Cicely. Mm -hmm. um, we had a lot of requests out to her, but she had just, she was working on her book, which just came out a couple, I believe, a week or- The so. same week as she passed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we relied on the, the archival footage mm -hmm. um, for, for, you know, from her. And Pam Greer, are you were able to yeah, interview her? You, you okay. Can do that. Yes. Okay, okay. Who's still, you know, working. And of course, Cicely was working up until the time that she passed. As it's well. amazing, yes. You know, 96. Yeah, incredible. Yeah. So, why don't we uh, go down the list of the, the women who you um, uh, showcase? And Lena Horn is certainly um, because she was a first, in a, you know, when, at least in the entertainment industry in Hollywood, sort of laid the groundwork and people were starting to refer to her um, as a trailblazer and even compare their careers to hers. And it's so sort of amazing that her father told Louis B. Mayer that he didn't want her to, she's not gonna play mate, you know. He, yeah, she's gonna get a contract, thank you very much, but you know, this is what's gonna happen. And the idea, and she even refers to it that, that, that a black man would talk to Louis B. Mayer or a head of a studio like that is quite something. Yeah, I mean, Lena Horn really set the, set the pathway, I feel like. I mean, we definitely had other, Black women entertainers who were before, like Josephine Baker and Freddie Washington, who you mentioned, and others, really early Black filmic, uh, Black actresses. But Lena Horne, by signing this contract in the early 1940s, she, a, a groundbreaking contract where she, you know, where her father negotiated with Louis B. Mayer that she wasn't going to play a maid. And remember, this was this was like 1940, 1941. This mm -hmm. was maybe two years after Gone with the Wind, which is mm -hmm. the you know the biggest Hollywood, the biggest film ever. I think still is, even if you look at like today's dollars, mm -hmm. right? Where you have the iconic Mammy character, which Hattie McDaniel won the Oscar for, and her she negotiated a contract where she wasn't going to play these roles. Um, and the studio agreed to it. Uh, and it was groundbreaking. The, the interesting thing is that it also created a backlash hmm. with the uh, actors, from the actors, black actors who were playing those roles, um, who said, well, if she doesn't play, you know, she's not gonna play these the roles and gonna you know, make this line in the sand. Well, are there still going to be roles for us? Mm -hmm. Because these actors, these black actors, since the dawn of Hollywood, have been playing those roles. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I think is interesting throughout the film is that you find this backlash throughout. Uh, you know, these women are making these the, the, are, are are groundbreaking and making these um, you know groundbreaking deals or roles, and then there's always a backlash mm -hmm. from not only the white community but from the black community as well. And, and I'm glad you mentioned that. And I um, shared with you the sort of personal story of, and I remember now the boy, and I mentioned Lena Horne to my mother and she said something about, oh, when she first came out, she, you know, she wasn't supposed to be, I'm using the term from the time, colored. And I was like, I, and you know, I was, what did I know at that point? It didn't seem, now it didn't seem right to me that that would be the case because if she's negotiating a, contracts <laughs> she's going to play um she's going to be who she is but I, I think because it was because of this the first role that she was in was in Panama Hattie and she was in kind of a Latin well this said to her I mean she talks about it yeah they said to her well why don't you play Latin because you don't look you can do it so you know uh, you don't need to be black <laughs> so play Latin and they promoted her 
as this Latin, they said, you know, who's this Latin singer? And she said she was not, that's not who she was. She did not want that to be, you know, how she was perceived. Mm -hmm. uh, but the studio wanted, wanted that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's so important to understand the sort of racist uh, underpinnings of Hollywood, how it was built on racism, right? Mm -hmm. um, and anything that was black was, you know, was demonized or stereotyped or hidden in Lena's case. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. But is that not even the idea of what is Latin that, you know, that that means that they're not people of African descent? Of course, that, yeah. yeah I, they weren't like looking at that, no. <laughs> no, no they, they couldn't yeah. wrap their head around that at all. Um, and the other thing about her, we you mentioned in the film about her connections with things like Cafe Society, which, yeah. you know, where she performed and uh, and also, which I didn't know about this, that Cafe Society had a kind of left wing connections in history. And that was fascinating that you revealed that. And then it got her into trouble a bit later with that and her association with Paul Robeson, who was a, you know, a left wing person. And, but he also was somebody who she talks about having mentored her politically. Yeah. So uh, did you find that about her and, and other people as well yeah, when you're doing your research? It was a really important um, important uh, space mm -hmm. for um, progressives, white and black. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's where uh, Billie Holiday, now there are two films about Billie that are just coming out, uh, one a documentary and one a film, mm -hmm. uh, where she performed Strange Fruit for the first time. And mm -hmm. so it was one of the only integrated nightclubs mm -hmm. at the time in the 1940s. So very, very early uh, in the village where activism and entertainment and folks uh, like Lena and Paul, uh, Paul Robeson came and, and Billie Holiday and performed in front of integrated audiences. Um, and that history is so, is so important and so, so, uh, so interesting. We don't have, we, I haven't been able to find footage from that time, but there's you no know, photos of, of Cafe Society. Um, and Paul Robeson was a family friend because we mm. didn't know, we didn't get into the, the biography of these women, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, Lena's parents, mm -hmm. Lena's grandparents were activists. So mm -hmm. Lena's grandparents, you know, her, um, she says in an interview, her grandmother made her when she was two, a lifetime yeah. member of the NAACP, right? right, right. right? Um, and she, uh, uh, so she was activist all of her life. That was her whole family mm -hmm. history. Mm -hmm. And Paul Robeson was a friend of her family. So she knew him as a friend mm -hmm. and as a, a mentor. And I think it was interesting about Paul Robeson too, that he really in some ways set the stage for the artist activist, for the black artist activist and influenced so many people. Mm -hmm. um, such an important figure and uh, you know, really show that you can be an artist and entertainer and be politically active as a political activist and be politically radical. And as you said, she um, <clears throat> she got pushback from that. I mean, more than pushback. She was in the in the late forties, early fifties. She was blacklisted because of her association with Paul Robeson during you know the anti communist. McCarthyism time where they were looking at, um, you know, targeting entertainers, black entertainers, but white entertainers as well, mm -hmm. who were political. Mm -hmm. And as, from your, as your film sort of indicates, she's had to negotiate something so she could get off it, but, um, but later that she did acknowledge that, you know, again, embrace Paul Robeson and say, you know, why he was so important to her. Absolutely. It was, yeah. it was so weird that it's not weird, but it's just horrible that it was that people had to distance themselves from somebody like that. Totally. Yeah. She had to do a lot to save her career. Mm -hmm. And the final thing I'll say at, in this stage about Lena Horn, I I looked and saw that I mean you talk about you talk about in the film how she after I think uh, Stormy Weather and and um, and what 
was the cabin in the sky, they were all black cast that the, the, where she would appear in, in movies would be just basically a, a song so they could cut her out. That's right. I mean, the other part about that contract is that she, because she had this contract where she wasn't going to play maids and, mm. and uh, servants and people in the jungle, then they, were, they didn't give her any roles. <laughs> they were like, well, we don't know what to do with you then. Right. And so you won't have any roles. And she was still cut out of those roles mm. even when she did appear. So she couldn't, because uh, of the South, because of the Southern market. So she couldn't actually have any meaningful roles um, because she'd be cut out um, and because, you know, Hollywood didn't know what to do with her if, they're not, if she's not going to play maids and servants and people, you know, savages in the jungle. And, and on INDB, which is the, I guess, the encyclopedia online about film and, and um, credits and everything, I saw all these things about Lena Horne, but they would have, they would say, they would acknowledge she was in a film, but she was, not only was she cut out, she was uncredited. Which is amazing to me is that you have somebody sign. I guess you're paying them theoretically, and you're not gonna you're not going to give them credit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. crazy time. So um, Abby Lincoln now, and she, uh, I, I mean she, she seems like to have the most kind of varied career because she was a both she was a start as a singer performer and then she was an act actor actress also, and um, she, you know I it. it there were periods when you know she could have gone maybe either way. Can you talk about that her career in that in that regard? Yeah, Abby Lincoln's super interesting, and, mm -hmm. and I learned a lot by making this film, uh, by reading the book and making this film. Mm -hmm. She um, she started out as uh, kind of in the vein of of Lena as a popular singer, a beauty you know beauty queen. Um, you know the famous thing is, and we talk about in the film, she wore mm -hmm. Marilyn Rose dress mm -hmm. uh, and the girl can't help it and that they were you know she was singing jazz standard popular standards um, and she had a transformation mm -hmm. in the late 50s early 60s when she met Max Roach uh, who she was married to and they who she got who she married and they produced uh, the Freedom Now suite uh, mm -hmm. in 1960 and um, the Freedom Now Suite was a very political album um, that was really one of the first uh, sort of popular political jazz albums where mm. she was, and she was the voice, she was the, the singer on the album, mm. um, where uh, you know, they were talking about the black freedom struggle and, and internationally, uh, colonialism, uh, you know, abroad voting rights, um, she has this famous scream mm -hmm. where she is really uh, personifying the experience of Black women uh, during slavery. Mm -hmm. And it's some radical stuff uh, that, you know, we haven't seen before. And, um, and, you know, this is before Nina Simone, who we also have to talk about in the film. So mm -hmm. she's very early very early in uh, putting her politics out there as a black woman. Um, mm -hmm. And then she has a album, her solo album, Straight Ahead, mm -hmm. which comes right after uh, Freedom Now Suite, where she continues, you know, this political, this, this, these uh, very, you know, what's considered radical politics. And she also has a physical transformation during this time where she went from, you know, uh, straight hair and sort of pinup girl and started wearing her hair natural, became, um, started, you know, uh, was dressing in Afrocentric, um, you know, Afrocentric garb, embracing her, her African, you know, embracing the fact that she was black and not trying to be these white beauty standards, which is mm. for generations been what we've been trying to do. And so she got a lot of backlash and pushback from that, from both the black and white community. Mm. Um, she also got specifically pushback from white critics about, and we show that in the film mm -hmm. uh, on Straight Ahead, where she had to defend, um, defend her work where you know, one critic, Ira Gertler's his name, called her 
um, that she was a professional Negro. She was using her Negro mm-hmm. too, too much. I mean, what does that even mean, right? But we show this footage where he's sort of attacking her about it. It's incredible. Um, and she doesn't, uh, you know, it really affected her and she doesn't really have another solo album until many years later. Mm-hmm. And she, during that time, she does two movies. She's in films. Mm-hmm. She goes back to films because she was an actress as well. But she also says how, as an actress, you know, though she got, was very noticed in these film roles, but that there, there wasn't really room for her there either mm-hmm. because, you know, because of the industry and because of the continued racism of the industry. Um, and then, of course, Abby, which we don't talk about so much in the film, but she has a much later, you know, uh, career as a jazz singer later mm-hmm. in life till the to the end of her life. But uh, I think Abby's Abby's trajectory and her experience is really important to understand how black entertain black women entertainers, and these are multifaceted mm-hmm. uh, entertainers, right? Singers and act actresses. Um, what they had to navigate at the time, uh, which we, you know, may not remember or talk about so much anymore because things, you know, are quite different. Um, but these women set the, you know, really set the stage mm-hmm. for for the women that we see thriving today in these industries. Well, it seemed that jazz freed her and being a, a, a singer and songwriter freed her to, to express herself. Because um, I remember the two movies she was in that in the '60s, uh, "Nothing But a Man," which is a classic and yeah. um, very you know progressive, and to "For Love of Ivy," which I it was playing in my neighborhood theater, and I you know when you're in and when I was you know 12 or 13 or whatever, and it it would keep playing and playing, so I would go to the movies every Saturday, and I kept seeing it, and. I think I, was, I have this memory of myself and a, of another friend of mine. We had, I think we saw her on TV, Abby Lincoln on TV or something. She had an afro. And yet in for love of Ivy, she had straight hair. And we like, where'd afro go? <laughs> you know? But clearly what you're saying is that they, um, she was, it's, I remember that film as her being the most real thing about that movie. Around um, for love of Ivy. For love of Ivy, yeah, yeah definitely yeah, the real yeah, as yeah. far as the performance yeah. and the like. But yeah. and continuing what you're saying about Lena Horne, it's like, you know, she, a, a black woman can be an actor in a movie, but then they don't, and then maybe it's a success, but then then what? They don't know what to do with her. Yeah, I mean, the interesting then, thing about Lena, Diane, and Abby is that they were all singers and actresses. Like mm-hmm. they all kind of went back and forth. I mean, Diane. Uh, she, you know, started as a singer, um, had these amazing roles that mm-hmm. you know, we may talk about, but then had to go back to being an actress. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, go back to being a, a, a singer mm-hmm. because the roles weren't for it, even after she'd been you know, nominated for Academy Awards. Mm-hmm. But with Diane Carroll, uh, Julia is the big thing that I think people remember for a breakout that in another medium, not in film, but in television and having this show around her. And um, that it was you know, another first, but also kind of controversial. I mean, how is it pushed back from some circles saying this is not, this is not real. Like this is not, this is not black enough, you know, indicating that there are middle class black people, but there, and of course there are um, and people, always of bringing up the idea that there's so few um, images and presentations of blackness and black people that whatever comes out has to represent everything and that's a whole um such a dilemma for for the for the actors the performers totally i mean we we see that you know even up until today but Mm -hmm. certainly during the time when julia she was the first black woman uh, or really one of the first black women to be in a TV show where she wasn't playing a maid, you know, mm-hmm. uh, it was groundbreaking. Uh, what I found out, I love, I found out this out making the film that the creator, Hal Cantor of, of, um, of Julia had also Done. been writing <laughs> yes. on Amos and Andy yeah. and Eula. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I thought that was fascinating. 
Um, so he created Julia uh, and, you know, this was a groundbreaking role. Um, and, but she did give pushback from, from the black community. And it, I think it was only on for like two years, even though it was very, popular. Yeah. Yeah, very popular. Um, and she said, you know, she says in the interview, she said, we had a right to tell this story, to have this character, even mm -hmm. if it wasn't, you know, this was in 68, it came on. Mm -hmm. So this was kind of as the rising black power, black militancy movement took hold. And she said, you know, we had a right to tell the story as a comedy. It was about a middle-class woman raising her kid, integrating this neighborhood. And it integrated the white people watching the film. It integrated mm -hmm. their houses. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they were, saw this character uh, for the first time. Mm -hmm. And that's another theme that's in the film is how these, char these characters that these women played not only changed perception of black people, but also of white people and their mm -hmm. perception of black people. Mm -hmm. I, I love that you have that section with, uh, I guess is on a show later with Diane Carroll sitting next to Red Fox. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Say. Yes. So great. I mean, it's Red Fox, so. Red Fox, yes, right. <laughs> For people who haven't seen, well, uh, people, he's, yeah. he's saying that she's a nurse and, you know, the only way she can afford her lifestyle is to be able to to take drugs in the hospital to sell it. But, um, and she, you know, it's out, by that time, I think the, the the TV show had been off for a while, so it was it was yeah. funny for everybody. Um, and Cicely Tyson, and she being an an actor, a model, model first, and an actor, and then um, also breakout roles with um, being in East Side West Side in the early '60s at a drama, um, and where she's a social worker, and it's a social issue drama. So she's breaking out and, and being really careful about what she, her activism is connected, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna play only things that are, that I think are real and inspiring and I, I won't do other things. So um, yeah, please talk about her. Yeah, and Cicely, you know, you mentioned the East Side, West Side. I mean, that's also in terms of uh, how she looked. I mean, mm. you have to remember that all these women that we just talked about, right, are all light skinned women. Mm. Um, I mean, really, and really that had been what uh, the only black women that were seen in Hollywood and Hollywood at the time, you know, who weren't playing mates, essentially, mm. Mm. right? So light skinned women, Diane, Lena, um, that was, you know, that was part of the reason why they had their success. And, and Diane actually talks about that. Mm -hmm. too in the film we have a clip of her talking about that so when Cicely comes to the fore she is a dark-skinned woman um beautiful dark-skinned woman she wears on east side west side which i think that clip is from 1962 she wears her mm -hmm. hair natural and it's believed to be the first time that a black woman wears an afro on television mm -hmm. um so she also has a style trailblaze, you know, is trailblazing in terms of her style. And then in terms of the roles that she plays, her breakout role is in Sounder in mm -hmm. 1972. Um, and she's considered by, you know, many critics, the first black heroine where we're able to see her play, you know, a multifaceted um, role that is heroic, that is vulnerable, Mm -hmm. That is, I love the uh, line that Latanya Richardson has in the film where she says, in my film, where she says, you know, Cicely broke it all open. She allowed that emotion, which we were not allowed to have. You know, mm -hmm. Lena had to be buttoned up. She had to play this, you know, a certain kind of role. By the time we get to Cicely, you know, she is breaking that open mm -hmm. and really um, changing uh, how black women can be on screen and also in a love relationship. Mm -hmm. That was the other thing that was so important. We didn't get to see, we have a commentator in the film who says that we didn't get to see black love. That was not, not something that you saw. Mm -hmm. um, and Cicely showed that in Sounder um, and showed that relationship. So that was like super important. Um, mm -hmm. And yes, she says also in many interviews that mm -hmm. she 
worked infrequently because she's mm. not going to take any roles. She's not going to do it. She mm. is only taking roles mm. which she feels will lift up uh, Black people. Mm-hmm. And that was her form of protest. Mm-hmm. That was her form of politics. And so that's why, you know, the way we, in the way, again, the way how it feels to be free understands what politics are for these entertainers. That mm-hmm. is part of their politics, the roles that they choose, mm-hmm. the, the, the negotiations that they make around the roles that they choose. Now, of course, you know, as we're talking about, it, it's not always perfect. It's not yeah. always, right, right, yeah. right. but it's the risk that they're taking around these choices. Um, which is why, you know, these women are grouped together. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't want to forget the um, Nina Simone and Pam Greer. Oh, yeah. um, so um, please talk to if, about Nina Simone. I want to get back to Pam Greer because there's a yeah. connection between her and Cicely Tyson, I think. Yeah, I mean, with Nina, you know, I, um, there's, so, I mean, Nina, you know, I think you first have to say Nina's one of our great American geniuses, mm-hmm. you know, musical geniuses. Um, and so multifaceted, right, in terms of her work and what it means and uh, everything. So this is a small part of, of Nina's mm-hmm. uh, legacy. And what I wanted to show was her legacy, what she, what she, uh, wh- who she was in terms of her politics and how that affected us as Black people. Um, one of the things that, one of the frustrations I have had uh, around white filmmakers telling our story is that they seem to focus on the tragedy mm. of our people. That seems to be, you know, a fetish of theirs. Um, and I think that that, and not that there isn't tragedy and there isn't, I'm not saying that's not a part of our, you know, history or these women or these entertainers' history, but yeah. for us, I think as black people, we understand the importance and of what these entertainers meant in terms of our culture, our politics, um, and the ent- and entertainment in general, mm-hmm. and how they changed the game in terms of music and and film and and all of that. So that's really what I wanted to focus on with with Nina, and that's really the 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 um, the take of the book that mm-hmm. I wanted to. The reason why I made the film is that mm-hmm. it's not a biopic of these women, but really looks at again their political work on stage and screen and how they change the game for black women and Nina Simone, you know, is a huge part of that. Um, we, in the film, you know, we look at her uh, Mississippi Goddamn, the meaning of that, what it meant, the risk that she took for women, the risk that she took, what she was talking about and how it affected subsequent black female artists. Um, so, I mean, you know, Nina Simone is, what, what else can I say? I, I was surprised to to learn that that black radio um, was resistant and didn't want to uh, broadcast yeah. for yeah. women totally because they were talking about I mean yeah you know she was talking about woolly hair hair and dark skin and women and black women you know uh, who were you know prostitutes and the different experiences that we've had. You know, black people don't want to hear that. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's there's you know, so there's so she was banned by a lot of that song was banned mm-hmm. by a lot of black radio, and they felt it was insulting. And I, the first time I heard it was in the late sixty or late sixty early seventies on what FM, the uh, you know, underground black radio. So it was changing. You know, yeah. radio was being affected by the social movement. So there's Bush packet space developed that you could yeah you could present Nina Simone's work yeah totally yeah yeah and you know and then you talk about Pam Greer yes. um you know who's the who comes in to the fore in the seventies with the black exploitation and again what I love about that story is looking at how black exploitation change you know change the game in terms of the representation that we saw of black people being powerful, being fighters, uh, being sexual, all the things mm-hmm. that we were not allowed to do, but also how it did become commodified 
Mm -hmm. And the stereotypes, you know, there's a critique about stereotypes that were being perpetuated. Mm -hmm. But the, also, too, another layer is how um, Black people, we have, you know, Jacqueline Stewart in the, in the film talk about how Black people saved the film industry. You know, those films are hugely popular during a time when film is, you know, similarly today, we see, you know, there are dwindling, you know, dwindling ticket sales mm -hmm. and all that. And black people save the film industry. Um, so, and then there's a pushback, and there's a pushback that happens amongst our own people. I mean, and Cicely Tyson right. against against black exploitation, and was a real critic of black exploitation. Pam Greer, of, of all the women in your film, Pam Greer is a movie star. I mean, in the sense that there's a Pam Greer movie. <laughs> you know, she is the star right. of all her yeah. movies. Yes. And so that, you know, there's, of course, there's that contradiction you mentioned about what the movies were, maybe for some people, but she was, you know, a star. And I think, and, and she's Im implying that at some point she could have maybe, um, if, if the powers that be were more open, she could have been producing and say, look, I've, I'm, I made all these successful movies. I want to do this. And she did. She talks about that. She wanted to do the Dorothy Dandridge story. She wanted to do the, um, you know, Stagecoach Mary. She wanted to do uh, African-American pilot. She wanted to do all these stories. Mm. And they said, no, no. And that's why, you know, we lead to where the real, real power is, is in black women telling their own stories mm -hmm. and getting behind the camera and being able to tell their own stories. Mm -hmm. And as we know, that's where the power is. Mm -hmm. But these women did lay the groundwork for what we, for the Avas and the Shandas and the Isas that we see today doing this amazing work. But these women had to, you know, had to lay the groundwork for that to happen. Mm -hmm. I wanted, we have oh, a little less than 15 minutes. I wanted to go to some of the questions here. And um, I'm going to the ones that I see. There was a question about the, the, fair use, but I think we answered that about what fair use is um, in, in the context of getting footage for films. Of a, maybe you could say about sentence more about what that means to people who don't know what fair use is for footage. Yeah, so just briefly, because it's a whole yes. thing. <laughs> um, fair use is a legal uh, mechanism which creators are using mm -hmm. Uh, in order to use this archival footage and um, not have to pay the exorbitant prices that they can often cost. And there are various, um, various, uh, uh, what, what would I say, various uh, ways in which you can sort of claim fair use. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there's, you know, you can, again, you can Google it and look at it, but the sort of big one is that you have to transform the footage. You have to, um, uh, and that means that you are, um, oh, I'm sorry, there are two ones. One, you are commentating on it. So if you look at, if you see how it feels to be free, we are, in most of the film, we are talking about the footage. We are comment mm -hmm. commentating on it, not using it uh, in terms of telling a story necessarily. Mm -hmm. It is telling a story, but, it is commentating on it. So when we show uh, Mammy from Gone with the Wind, we're talking about how Hollywood uh, is, um, you know, how Hollywood traffics in these stereotypes and then show a clip from, from Mammy or from Gone with the Wind or Birth of a Nation. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also transforming the footage. So we're not using it in the same way that, you know, that Birth of a Nation uses mm -hmm. the footage or Gone with the Wind, but there are four, um, criteria is that you have to meet, you need to work with a lawyer to do it. Um, and it's a very complicated process, not like you can just say, I'm fair use. I'm fair use, right. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So I would, I would, um, if you go to, uh, if you go to um, American University uh, and is it Pat, uh, what's her name? Patricia? Pat, Pat, uh, Patricia Often Hyde. Exactly. Patricia Often Hyde. Hyde who really writes about this very clearly, um, I, would, I would advise you to go and look and you can you know, read about fair use, understand it. Um, okay. 
and it's definitely a tool that creators are using in order to, um, you know, in order to, to, to be able to tell our stories. Right. Thank you. And there's a question about, um, or comment about Mary Makiba. Could uh, speak to, could you speak to the swapping out of Mary Makiba? Many of the artists of the past were shifted by their trips to African countries and speak about it in their interviews. Cicely Tyson on Roots, Nina Simone, et cetera. Was this maybe a missed opportunity to speak more to that? No, it's just a choice that I made. So you're always making choices in films. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the way it is. Mm -hmm. um, and with Mary McCabe, I actually, when the film, uh, when, the, when I started working on this film, it also took five years. There just mm -hmm. been a documentary about Mary McCabe. In exactly. That. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and as I said, I wanted to focus on bringing us to a contemporary moment mm -hmm. and, um, and getting us, how can I get structurally and story-wise to where we are today in mm -hmm. terms of, of Black female storytelling. And so it made sense for me to, um, you know, to, to, uh, to, to include Pam Greer and swap out Mary McCabe, who's an amazing artist and who mm -hmm. I love, but there is a documentary. And again, that documentary had just come out, but yeah, it's really just about the choices. Yeah, it's Mama Africa, the name of that documentary. We actually showed it at the museum yeah. of the African diaspora. Um, one final question for me about, um, was there something when you are doing the research and finding out about all these women, is something that really, really surprised you and stood out about them? Um, I think I kind of mentioned this through our conversation, but the mm -hmm. backlash mm -hmm. that always happened as these women broke through, there was always a backlash. Mm -hmm. So that was, um, super and a backlash from not just white people, but from mm -hmm. black people. Mm -hmm. So that was really, really interesting to me. Um, um, what else? Um, and, you know, Abby Lincoln's story, I thought was really under told and I didn't know about. So that was a revelation to me as well. Okay. So um, I fear that I'm missing some of the questions. So I'm going to call in Elizabeth. I feel like I'm on how to, how, how to make a million dollars. I have to get my person from the outside to come and help <laughs> with, um, the question. Well, I see one question, where do you see black films going today? Okay. okay. So I think one thing is that we are, you know, in our racial reckoning, which we seem to always be, but there's an, <laughs> another one happening now. And I asked the, you know, some of the people that I interviewed, like Lena Waithe, like, you know, where, and Yolanda Ross, where, you know, what's the future? And I think the future is yet to be seen. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're in a, I, I'm so grateful that I'm living in a time when we have so many amazing black filmmakers who are working and who are um, create, you know, doing amazing, producing amazing content. Uh, but we have to keep pushing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have to, I, I can't see us going back, that, that doesn't make sense, mm -hmm. going back to the time when we don't have it, but you never know. I mean, Hollywood is still run by you know mostly white men who are green lighting and funding stuff. So until that changes, I you know I think it's a real question of okay. of what the future is for black filmmaking. Thank you. Thank you. So you de dedicate the film to your mother, Aisha Rahman, who was a playwright and involved in the Black Arts Movement. And I'm I'd like you to talk about if you if you would like to talk about that background and being involved and in growing up in that political and cultural milieu and how it affected you and, 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 you know, just, uh, re reflect on that for us and tell yes. and if you want to tell us more about your mother's sure. uh, work. Thank you for, for asking. So sure. yeah, my mom, uh, his name is Aisha Rahman. She passed about six years ago and mm -hmm. she was a playwright um, who was part of the black arts movement um, her most famous play is called, or her most well-known produced play is called Unfinished Women Cry in No Man's Land While a Bird Dies in a Gilded Cage, mm -hmm. uh, which was done, which was produced at the Public Theater mm -hmm. in uh, 1977 and produced at many colleges. She also has a memoir called um, Chewed Water. And my mom was a, she's a, 
playwright, she was an artist that always connected politics and art. That was just how she, you know, what she was writing about and the experience particularly of black women. And, you know, I, I didn't understand, though, though I grew up with, um, you know, I grew up with typing, like that's some of my earliest memories during the typewriter, like in the morning when she would write, I didn't understand what she was doing. Like she would tell me this stuff and, you know, but it is embedded in me. Um, and uh, so as, you know, got, getting older, understanding her work, she wrote a, a play about police brutality in uh, 19, you know, she was talking about this in, in the 19, in the early eighties um, called, called, um, uh, the Mojo and the Say So. Uh, and so she was really looking at, I mean, she always said she was ahead of her time and she was right. Mm -hmm. um, but really looking at the experience of black people and of black women and bringing that, that to the forefront. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when I started, you know, making documentaries, uh, she, you know, was my biggest critic and my biggest fan. And she's the reason why I am able to do the work that I'm able to do is because of her support and her insight um, into, you know, the storytelling and to, and to uh, you know, and to how we, how we, um, yeah, and to our storytelling about our experience. You know, I learned that from her. What, uh, in the few minutes we have left, tell us about your eclectic career and your trajectory from, um, you know, where you started and, and how you became a documentary filmmaker because you didn't go to, or did you go to school to be a documentary filmmaker? No, I didn't go to school to be a documentary filmmaker, but because I had this background in theater, and I mm -hmm. will say that once you start talking to people, a lot of documentary people have a background in theater. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a whole nother conversation I can have about why that's the case. But yeah, I, so I grew up doing, um, you know, theater and was it, I went to performing arts high school and I was, you know, in acting and then in college acting and directing. And, and then I discovered video uh, documentaries, never it seemed like it could be, you know, an actual job <laughs> right. in the nineties when the, when the, when the equipment got smaller and um, more user-friendly, I started making videos. Uh, and then I, um, I was, I did a graduate program in, at, at Berkeley, UC Berkeley, got a master's, but moved back to New York and started working under a filmmaker, St. Clair Bourne, who was one of our um, amazing trailblazing documentary filmmakers who hired me uh, because of, he knew he and my mom were old friends. Okay. Um, and I, that's how I started. He mentored me and I, you know, that's how I started in, in production. I went over to the news side for a little bit and, um, and then started making my first film, so. Okay. Well, there's somebody who was um, sort of questioning about if you're gonna do a part two of this, but it sounds like you're not, but you're doing other things. Yes, many other <laughs> things. People always want a part two. It's like, it took me five years to make this. I need to work on other stuff. Um, but I will say, if you're interested in my work, um, mm -hmm. please check out the sit-in, Harry Belafonte hosts The Tonight Show, uh, which is streaming on Peacock, uh, and uh, Breonna Taylor, The Killing of Breonna Taylor, which is on, um, on Hulu. And those are two films that came out this year. And they're both superb works. Thank you very much for that. And it seems like you're uh, interested in social history as a, as a documentary filmmaker, and that's the trajectory and the, the area that you want to, that you have been going in. Is that, um, if, if, if that's accurate, is maybe you could say a little bit, a bit about why that's why you, that's well, why you think it interests you? I think I'm interested and I'm definitely interested in, um, you know, our experience in this country and in the world as Africans and Africa, a part of the African diaspora. Mm. Um, I'm interested in the history. There's so many, so much to be told about our history. It's just amazing. But I'm also interested in what's happening now. So like the Breonna Taylor film is an example of that. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I'm, I'm there, there's a lot, there's a lot of stories out there. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot to be told and there's a lot that has been mistold. Uh, so as a filmmaker, you know, those are, those are the things that attract me. 
and different takes on you know what we think we know. Is there a place where people can follow your career? Uh, yes, I'm on Facebook. So mm -hmm. please, you can become my friend on Facebook, Instagram, at Red Rooms 14, um, and Twitter. So those are places. Okay, okay. great. And now this film, uh, where can people see it? Yeah, so I'm going to put it in the, in the chat. Okay, um, great. So How It Feels to Be Free is streaming on Amazon Prime. Okay. On Amazon Prime Video. Thank you. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Know, you. Yeah. Great to talk. Wonderful to talk. And and I look forward to your next works. And people definitely need to, to see the sit-in and, yeah. and the, the film one, uh, Brianna Taylor. Thank you so much. Sure. Have a good night. You too. Night. Thank you, Yoruba. Thank you, Cornelius, for that wonderful conversation. I know everyone's excited to see this film who hasn't seen it yet um, and more of your work as well. Um, I want to thank our co-sponsor for today's program, Black Public Media. And just to let everyone know that our next uh, African Diaspora Film Club is going to be somewhat of a double feature. It'll be on Sunday, March 15th at 5 p.m. and we'll be discussing the phenomenal work of director Thomas Allen Harris, including his 2014 documentary Through a Lens Darkly, Black Photographers and the Emergence of a People, and his current PBS series Family Pictures USA. Um, and I put the link to that program in the chat. You can also just check out our calendar on the MOAD website. Um, and please take a few minutes to respond to a virtual program survey that um, is going to pop up when you leave this Zoom. So thank you all so much for being with us tonight. And thank you again, Yoruba and Cornelius, and have a wonderful evening. Um, and we'll have to have you out for another week-long residency again, <laughs> Yoruba. Thank all you. Right. Thank you. All right. All right. Bye. 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 Thank <laughs> you.